some men will call them females. Females this, females that, oh yeah. man, females that, is incredibly dehumanizing because any animal can be a female, only humans can be women. And people will say, oh well, but people call men males. No, they don't. <laughs> no. No, they don't. When was the last time you were called a male, Ollie? I've never been called a male. The only context is like when you're ironically saying, what a fine specimen of a male. And that's tongue in cheek. Yeah. Like you're using that dehumanization, like they're a specimen, they're not a person. If, if people are making that argument, like they're not being serious. They are very unserious people because calling women females is dehumanizing. Yeah. You're essentially implying that they are animals. Hi, Benji here, and I'm going to explain why the word boy can have racist connotations. Before you start typing, I'm not saying that the dictionary definition of the word boy is racist. But boy does have a history of being used as a racial epithet against black men. An epithet is a term used to prescribe a certain quality or attribute to someone. And boy, most prominently during segregation in the States, was used to infantilize and subjugate black men, to essentially remind them of their inferiority. A similar example is calling a black man or any man son. It's one of many ways that black men often have their maturity exaggerated or understated depending on what will justify the harsher consequence. The racist impact of this is very dependent on context, environment, inflection, tone of voice, who's saying it, etc. Similar to how calling a woman baby can be misogynistic, but it's just a subtle form of racial aggression that's useful to be aware of. Hope that helps. Bye. COVID is still the third leading cause of death in the US, as it has been since 2020 and the majority of people dying now are vaccinated. U.S. life expectancy dropped precipitously for the third year in a row. But you can be forgiven for not knowing any of this. Despite the squad's constant presence on social media, they're too busy talking about everything from Republican chaos to their skincare routines to spare an Instagram story for the dying and dead public. They also apparently think masks are just so 2020. From AOC to Bowman to Cesar to Lee, it's masks off and middle fingers up to the disabled comrades and allies who continue to beg for basic precautions. Amidst all the political theater going on, I think Julia in this essay really directly confronts the hypocrisy of Democrats in normalizing COVID under Biden just as they did under Trump. So no, can't say I'm laughing at any of these memes about the Republican Party falling apart. It's actually really problematic that so many Americans have been misled to believe that being a moderate is equated with being reasonable. Do you want to know why? It's because both parties in the United States that uh, since the 70s have grown increasingly conservative, they're now equating what was conserving in an equitable system with being reasonable. So think about it. If we had liberals, of course, both parties are pro-capitalism. Um, they send a message as if capitalism is the only reasonable um, and possible system because they treat it as if it's always existed, even though that's not true. And then they act as if anyone who demands basic things because we need them to survive is somehow wrong. And that's really fucked up. This bill would forcibly medically detransition all transgender people under the age of 20. All right, are all the transphobes out there ready to give up the whole it's to protect the kids narrative right now? Because in no universe can you articulate that that applies to people up to the age of 26. And we told you last year that this was going to fucking happen. Just let's be intellectually honest about this. If you're trying to pass these laws, just say you hate trans people and you're trying to kill them. You can't argue it's about kids anymore. 26. Fucking 26. See, the problem is, as you get closer and closer to your goal, your true intentions become more apparent, which hopefully is going to finally get people to step the fuck up and fight back. And if you consider yourself an ally and you're not talking about this, shut the fuck up, you're not. And I don't care what you think. If you vote for this party, you are not an ally. You're part of the fucking problem. The annual meeting of the World Economic Forum is happening in Davos, Switzerland right now. And I want to talk to you about it, but maybe not for the reason you think. Because I want to talk to you about how you're being gaslit. Leaders around the world are basically telling us that COVID is over and to carry on as normal. But what do they do when they're all together in one space? Well, look no further than this photo. Notice those weird lights right about there? 
Those are UV lights, meant to kill airborne viruses. You see, they know they're lying to you. They know that COVID is still an active threat. So let's take a moment to look at the precautions being taken at the World Economic Forum meeting, shall we? This is what world leaders are actually doing to keep themselves safe. Not you, themselves. For starters, everyone has to take a PCR test upon arrival. They all have a special badge with a chip in it that only works once they've got a negative test. Just for starters. They also have testing centers throughout the forum. You know, because people only take COVID tests if they're convenient. How convenient is it for you to get a PCR test? I'm guessing not very. But there's more. They've also enhanced ventilation. See why this guy's wearing his jacket? It's because they're keeping windows open in enclosed spaces whenever possible. And this down here? That's a HEPA filter. You know, to keep them safe. Again, not you, them. And there are these UV lights all over the place, too. You'll notice the masking as well. And the UV lights are everywhere. They know exactly what they're doing. They're keeping themselves safe while convincing you that they don't need to keep you safe. Safety measures for we, but not for thee. This is gaslighting. This is world leaders knowing what they need to do to keep themselves safe and not doing it to keep you safe. That's what's really happening here. Ask yourself, why aren't these precautions being taken in public spaces, like schools or hospitals? Although they are very quietly being taken in the UK Parliament building. Weird that they chose to upgrade the air filtration there, but nowhere else. It's almost as if world leaders only care about themselves. Almost. Censorship of fascists and far-right reactionaries is good. We should be censoring the people who are turning young men into mass shooters. Am I tweaking? So this is discussed in the Communist Manifesto, also in the Principles of Communism and other Marxist texts, but these ones are very short, like an hour, audiobook each. But basically, capitalists, they produce things uh, for profit, not for need. And if they produce too many donuts, it'll lead to a decrease in price. This is because the demand for donuts is low and the supply is really high. So it'll lead to cheaper donuts. Capitalists don't want this because it means less profit for them. So they'll artificially lower the supply of food by destroying it at the end of the day to keep the price high. They'll rather throw out perfectly good food than to give it, pe give it to people who need it um, because it'll affect their bottom line. And if one capitalist isn't willing to do it, another one will. Um, this is just one example of how like illogical and anti-human capitalism is and how we're all victimized by like the anarchy of markets. Do you know why Black History Month is in February? Black History Month started out as Negro History Week, pioneered by Carter G. Woodson in 1926. He specifically picked February because many African Americans in the 1920s celebrated the birthday of President Abraham Lincoln, which is on February 12th. And many African Americans also celebrated the life of abolitionist Frederick Douglass on February 14th. Negro History Week took off and evolved over time, and in the 1960s, it had been expanded from a week to Black History Month. And in February of 1976, President Gerald Ford publicly acknowledged Black History Month and urged Americans everywhere to celebrate the history of Black Americans. Why does Black Pride come off as... But white pride comes off as just a good old boy. Never mean it no harm. This is Dara Star Tucker, and this is the breakdown.
Black and white pride come off very differently in the U.S. because of the way that race and culture developed here. See, the concept of race is a colonial construct. It's a theory based on pseudoscience that was developed to create a hierarchy to group people by skin color. The theory of race falsely claims that people who come from sub-Saharan Africa are at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of intelligence, desirability, and overall worth. It made them subhuman. The lighter your skin was, the more valuable and entitled you were. It's all made up, since the concept of race is not attached to any legitimate biological or scientific truths. Race is not real. But racism is. Black people were brought to the United States in chains from countries all over the continent of Africa, like Nigeria, Ghana, the Congo, and the Ivory Coast, with their own unique ethnicities, traditions, and cultures. But when they hit U.S. shores, they were simply called Negroes, and their cultures were stripped away. The people with white skin who migrated from countries like England, Germany, the Netherlands, and Spain, Caucasians, brought their cultures with them. So colonial powers cut black people off from the rest of American society. They weren't allowed to attend school, they had to develop their own worship services and their own social framework, but they were also cut off from their cultures of origin. They weren't allowed to practice their religions or speak their languages of origin, and their social customs from their homeland started to fade over time. So what do you think they did? They began to develop a distinct culture of their own. This is what's known as Black American culture. Blackness in the U.S. is not just a color or a racial grouping based on pseudoscience. It's a culture. It represents triumph in the face of extreme adversity. It's something to take pride in. If you're a white person in the U.S., you can probably trace your ancestry back through many generations. Descendants of enslaved people usually can't do this. Records generally were not kept of marriages of enslaved people if they were allowed to marry at all. It was illegal for them to learn how to read and write, so they weren't able to pass down any of their own family histories or customs. Southern pride can often be a stand-in for toxic masculinity, racism, and the fear of outsiders. So much of it was born of the need to marginalize, oppress, and harm non-white people that it can carry an earned stigma in the minds of so many people. And so much of mainstream American culture has descended into gross consumerism. Many Americans would be hard-pressed to define what their culture is outside of Walmart, Applebee's, and megachurches. In short, black pride developed out of the need to overcome her horrific circumstances. Black culture was born out of triumph in the face of isolation, hardship, and persecution. It's pride that's tied to achievement. Things like Irish pride, Italian pride, Scottish pride, they're attached to culture and should be celebrated as well. But white pride? Well, that's simply a celebration that you were born at the top of a phony racial pyramid, and it carries all of the ugly baggage that comes with that complicated history in the United States. To learn more about this topic, visit the reading list at the link in my bio.